On today's episode of the Grab Matters podcast, we welcome on a very special guest, Trevor Hansen. Trevor is a former professional wakeboarder from here in Florida. Uh, he got his start in the early days of wakeboarding. Uh, we talked with him about what the contest scene was like back then, sponsorships, what it's like to develop your own board. Uh, Trevor does a lot of coaching, so we talk with him about that, some tips he has that can help you know pretty much every rider out there. We also talk to PWT, his current involvement in the Pro Wakeboard Tour. Uh, we also kind of get into the future of wakeboarding and you know what he's seeing and hearing in terms of growth of the sport. I want to say thank you to all the Patreon subscribers. Uh, your guys' support is what makes this podcast possible, so thank you a ton. Um, if you are interested in supporting the podcast joining the patreon is the best way to do that you get to see who the guests are early and then you can submit a question um, for me to ask on the podcast here without further ado hope you enjoy this episode of the grab matters podcast i approve water porting they're talking about wakeboarding the thing about wakeboarding every trick is an inverse backside Backside. air railing a new dimension all right we're back another episode of the grab matters podcast today we'll come on a very special guest trevor hansen how's it going thank you sir yep excited to be here Excited to have you, man. Thanks for coming out. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I usually start off with a few questions. I think you may have listened to the podcast before, so you might know what's coming. But uh, wake pants, yes or no? Man, so I have a hard time with this one because I don't feel like it's a yes or no answer. Oh. You know, I think that it's discipline. Uh, it depends on your discipline. Because if a dude shows up on the boat and has pants on, I have a little bit of an issue with that. But on the cable or winching or something like that, I think it's a totally different deal. So okay. I would say for my discipline, I would say no. Discipline but meaning behind the boat? Behind the boat. No. But if you're if you're riding the cable or hitting a winch spot or something like that, I think it's a little bit more acceptable. I feel like that, that might be a common-ish answer among the boat the boat goers. Yeah. But it's also coming from a dude that saved money so that I could buy the original wake pants. When Do I you was still young. have them? I don't. That'd be I, sick I, I wish did. that I did. Because, like, you know, in my generation, you know, Shane's only, like, a year or two older than me. and He was, like, an absolute hero uh, when I was, you know, watching all the videos and stuff like that. So, yeah. as soon as he had those pants, I said, I got to have those. <laughs> so, but they were, they were very short-lived. Very short-lived. That's what I did here. I, I, I wonder if, I, for, I think I forgot to ask Shane if he has any pairs left, but I should, oh. I should see if he does. He's got to. Uh, favorite grab? Uh, tail. I, I was always a tail guy. I, I like it. I think it looks cool. Um, I like the way that you can poke it out. And even though Ben said it's the easiest grab in the world and that it's totally lame, I, I still like it. <laughs> it is, I mean, I don't know if it's easier than Indy. I feel like Indy is the easiest. Or maybe even Melon's easier. I feel like Tail isn't the easiest one, personally. It's hard to reach in some in some tricks. You know, it just depends on what it is. Yeah. And I think some guys can do it good and some guys can't. I think I think that's the same with all grabs. True. You it know? is a matter of the person that do it, that's doing it. You know, like there's a, you know, nuclear grabs aren't the most popular thing in the world. That one's hard to get to, but a lot of guys, that was like super easy for them. True. So you got to do some yoga if you're trying to get, you know, right. the cross body ones. Twi- I'm not <laughs> twist, twist it up. I'm not too good at those ones. <laughs> uh, so I was talking to Reed Hansen, your brother. He's yep. been on the pod before. Um, and he wants to know what the best day of your life was and why it was with Jordan Bulch. Did oh, I say that man. right? Oh yeah, you did. Um, I was wondering where you were going with the best day of life thing. I'm like, all right, my kid's getting born. Which one? But no, he's right, Jordan Bulch. So, dude, we did this. Jordan Bulch is a um, he is a family member of the racetrack family. So, racetrack uh, fuel stations are privately owned. Um, it's one family that owns all of them. And he wanted to make a music video. He's like uh, in the music industry and trying to make his come up. And so, we get hired to go and do a music video and I wouldn't even be able to describe properly what this day was like like we woke up early drove out to Eustis to this private lake and they've got jet ski stand up jet skis getting unloaded they've got buses full of models getting unloaded they've got seaplanes they've got all this stuff and like none of it makes any sense at all and we're just at some guy's house and we laughed from six o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night when we were done because we just couldn't believe what we were being paid to do like they've got a seaplane coming into land while he's walking off the seaplane onto the dock that reads like acid dropping into there's a dude on a sea dude doing backflips in the background there's all these models dancing and like there's no (laughs) music or anything like it's just the most wild scene and we're just laughing it was hilarious i got bit by a monkey well, yeah. Where was, this it, was in Florida? In Florida. 
Exactly. Some someone brought a pet monkey, and Reed didn't. I forgot about it, and it was like a year later. Reed goes, "You got bit by a monkey that day." And I said, "Oh, I, yeah, you're right." So much I, happened. Yeah, that there's day. so much going on that that was like just in the background. Wild. Yeah. Interesting. It was a very fun day. Can where can this music video be found? Oh, it can be found. It can be found. It can be found. I guess I got the guy's name, so that's yeah. probably all I need yeah. for my internet yeah. sleuthing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's dive into how you got into water sports. So kind of where you're from, how you got into into water sports and wakeboarding. Yeah, so um, from here in Orlando, Florida, and um, been been in the industry my whole life pretty much because my parents both skied at SeaWorld and Cypress Gardens. Um, they are from you know the Midwest. They're, my mom's from Indianapolis. My dad's from Illinois, and uh, both have show ski. Well, my dad actually, my dad's family has a show ski background, but my mom's family didn't. She just kind of got into it. Hmm. Um, they moved down separately and met down here while they were seeing at SeaWorld. And, uh, you know, when we were growing up, um, my dad still worked at SeaWorld. We would do like a little bit of skiing, but we didn't live on the lake or anything. And then after he had Reed or after my family had Reed, they, um, he stopped working at SeaWorld and started working for Regal and was doing sales managing stuff for them. Um, and then we weren't on the water. We didn't really, we would ski and stuff every now and then because we had friends and we still would get out on the boat, but only a handful of times a year. And then my dad had the opportunity to buy um, the Benzel Skiing Center, which was a, a well-established water ski camp. And once he bought that, I mean, we dove headfirst into, into skiing every day. Like we already had done it. You know, like I learned how to ski when I was six months old. Like I was also a ski baby, yeah. like parks. I, got, I still got the super tiny little wetsuit and my skis and all that stuff. Um, was barefooting by three. Like I've been doing it my whole life, yeah. but wasn't on the water every day until we bought that camp. And we ran it as a three event camp for the first couple of years. And then wakeboarding took off and we switched pretty exclusively to wakeboarding. Yeah. So you, when, when did you start wakeboarding? 98, 97? Yeah, so 90, 97 was the first year that I competed. Okay. Um, and so I rode in like a couple small events, like the performance uh, gravel tours and like the X Cups that were here in Florida. Um, I rode in those. And then 97 Worlds is really like, I went to 97 Worlds. I think it was at Cranes Roost Park, if I remember right. Um, and watching all the guys, like watching Randall and Hunter Brown back then, um, and a couple of the younger guys, I was like, dude, this is what I want to do. Like, I don't want to ski anymore. And so it was a joke because my dad bought me a, um, he bought me a ski, a brand new ski for my birthday in 98. And I was like, no, dude, this don't thing, need that I don't, thing. I don't need this anymore. <laughs> like I'm, I'm head first into the wakeboard game. And, uh, so then I rode, um, I rode in the boys division in 98 and 99 and did really well. And then, uh, transitioned into junior men's for, uh, 2000 and yeah because 99 you won i guess i was looking at I don't know, what was like junior worlds you won and then some other stuff too yeah so i won pretty much everything yeah. in in 99 98 i got second to jeff mckee um he won the worlds that year and good was, i had a boy jeff yeah that's right that's <laughs> right it was a tight it was a tight score too like it was really close me and him were were neck and neck um and so he won that year and then uh the following year like i think i had like a clean sweep like i won all, all of the all of the big events that were in the boys division um it wasn't called weight games back then but whatever the the first stop that we had and yeah. then the nationals and the worlds and all that um won all of those for boys and then uh, i did the same thing in junior men's the following year so what kind of tricks are you putting down in like 98 99 what's that what's the pass looking like dude so my um my learning curve was pretty pretty quick um I picked up some pretty technical tricks really quick. I skipped a lot of a lot of early tricks that you would like grabbing the board and and basic spins and stuff. I just skipped all that stuff. Like whirly a whirly bird was the third invert that I ever learned. Like I went uh, tantrum toe side back roll whirly bird. Um, so I was pretty quick to the tech stuff. I jumped on the trampoline all day every day and was just comfortable doing that. Um, so I was doing. I don't remember in my boys' past, but I probably had like a K, a rap KGB, um, whirly bird, tootsie roll, that kind of stuff. Yeah, got them um, locked in though. Like yeah, 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 super consistent and and was feeling dialed. And then I picked up, um, you know, going into junior men's, 
because that was a big year, man. 2000, like if you go look at the list of riders that were in 2000 in junior men's and not just who they were, but how many there were. Like we had, I think it was like 102 uh, junior men riders that signed up for nationals. And we had a full day, like they had to run Thursday was just junior men riders. There wasn't any other divisions that rode that day. And so it was just all junior men guys, um, huge heats, big cuts. And uh, it was a lot, a lot of really good riders. Big cuts, meaning not a lot of people made it through. Not a lot of people, yeah, because you had to, I mean, they had to take 100 guys down to like 20. So you're talking big heats and only one or two guys going through. Jeez. It was rough. (laughs) It was real rough. Uh, What is the seahorse? The seahorse. um, So back in the day, I used to ride with this guy, Mike McClinn, who I think might be one of the most underrated riders um, of all time. He was a dude that lived out in Claremont and rode for Neptune for a little while. And, uh, he could do like every trick in the, in the book. He'd switch and regular. He was just one of those guys that could do everything. And, uh, we were out messing around one day and we're just trying to come up with different stuff. And we started landing. He started landing like with the rope in between his legs. And so he'd like do a trick and then pass the handle in between his legs and have his arm going through his legs with the handle on the other side just a funny little thing we called it the seahorse you, you two invented that though probably right i guess because what because shane used to do on a rail right or an, even in, like on a rail he would pass the handle through his legs and that was like the baller or something i don't know yeah maybe i think S- similar type circus trickery is what yeah doing back when spins were going on on the rails and spinning through and passing the handle through well some people are still doing that today but yeah, yeah. <laughs> So O-Dub at this time is open, and you spent a little bit of time at the cable, right, growing yeah. up? Yeah. So how much would you say that that helped your riding, at least, you know, on the boat side of things? Well, back th- back then, um, wakeboarding was so different that you had to – the wakes weren't so big, and so you had to learn how to use your edge anyway. And so learning air tricks on the cable – and, like, there was no rails at O-Dub. Like, when we first – when that place first opened for, I think, the first year or two, there was no obstacles at all. It was just – um, just the turns. And so we were, I think, I can't remember if it was 98 or 99 or when it was, but I, I think I won the, um, the cable worlds for the boys or the junior men's, um, one of those years, but it was like maybe one rail. I think that they like, you know, made some kind of floating little apparatus and then it was just, you know, S bins and S bend to blinds and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but the cable helped. I mean, it was a place to go. Like back then, we were just looking to get on the water. So like anything that you could do to uh, to spend more time out on the water and mess around, play with the Indian line and all that stuff was fun. Yeah, I feel like just time with your hands in the handle and your board on the water is like, regardless of what it's behind, it could be behind a jet ski or a, a nice wakeboard boat or a cable. Like that time is invaluable. The more time you get, the better you're going to be. Absol- so, absolutely. Yeah. So when, uh, when, when you start picking up some sponsors? Um. Pretty right away, the uh, I think that it was '98 um, at the Worlds is kind of when I got my first sponsor, and it was Hyperlight. And uh, I had already I had already talked to Paul O'Brien back then. You know, I was super young; I was only 13, and so my dad was doing a lot of the phone calls and all that stuff. So he had already talked to Paul, and I'd briefly talked to him, um, but I'd never met him, and. Uh, he told me to make a, you know, a sponsor me tape. That's what all the guys used to make back then. And so I was in the process of making that tape. Like we were, you know, working on it. We, my dad had bought like a little editing machine and we're trying to throw together a little sponsor me tape. And, um, after I rode at that event, he came down and introduced me himself and talked to him for a little while. And he was like, don't worry about the tape, man. Like we'll just, we'll get you set up and be ready. So, uh, pretty much signed with him right there. So what's Hyperlight looking like as a little grommet? You remember? Um, man, I think that the first year it probably was just flow, um, getting some product yeah. and stuff like that. But it, it, it escalated pretty quick. Like I really, I was making a couple hundred bucks by year two, a um, couple hundred bucks a month. And I don't remember how much it was. It could have been three or four hundred dollars or maybe as much as five hundred. Parents kind of probably handled that for yeah, the most part. Yeah, it's probably, <laughs> probably as much as five hundred dollars. Um, and uh yeah, I mean, it was sick. Like, I was just stoked to be, like, Hyperlight back then, to me, was, like, it, you yeah. know? Because I grew up, you know, Murray, we had, because we had the camp, like, we had a ton of guys come through the house. So, like, we would always have a ton of, of people to ride with, and guys would come, because we would have, 
you know, different wakeboard boats and there was always a driver and always someone around. We were running three boats on three different lakes. So there was always, always someone to ride with. So run through the camp a little bit. So did you guys have your own boat there? And if so, what boat was that? And then what, yeah, what's the lake situation like? So we had, um, when we first bought the camp, it was basically like a trailer park. And so there was trailers that, um, everyone stayed in. So we had, um, you know, they were almost like duplexes. So you'd have a, a single wide trailer where there was a wall in the middle and then there'd be like two dorms on each side with two little entryways and decks and stuff. And we had 10 of those. And then we had a, a like a staff lodging building that was just like the only actual building um, where all the staff guys would stay. And then we had a trailer that we lived in. And so it was like it actually funny looking back now like you're like look at trailer park boys and that's basically what <laughs> wwc was like we were just like our <laughs> own little trailer park and just a bunch of wakeboarding going on um but we it was on the lake so we had that was lake one or actually that was moon lake um and it was tiny little lake like we're talking barely big enough for a slalom course and looking back now like if i were to drive you past the lake you'd be like you guys were wakeboarding on that deal like weeds throughout the whole lake, like maybe 10 feet deep at the absolute mm. deepest part. And then the rest of it was probably averaging like four to five. Wow. So super shallow. Um, and then we had Lake David, which is where they do the pro tour. So we had access to that, um, in Groveland. So that's where they've done the pro tour the past couple of years. Um, we rode on that lake. So I grew up riding on that lake, hosted a bunch of, uh, local events. Um, there was some long running, um, they called it like the Liz Allen Open, and then the Benzels had their own series. But there was like some pretty major water ski events held on that gotcha. lake for a long time. Um, so we had access to that lake, so we used that one. And then um, we had a, a lake called Lake One, which is where the camp um, actually moved to eventually. Um, we we had access to that one. And then Lake Two. So we had like four four different lakes. Do these connect? No, they don't connect. connect. Okay. So we had vans. So we had a bunch of 15 passenger vans with trailers that you would load up. Like we would come up with a list in the morning and you'd go to the board and you'd see where you're, what lake you were supposed to go to, which van you were supposed to be in. And everyone would have to load their boards, gas tanks and all that onto the trailer. And then we'd jump in the van and drive to the lake. And we did that every day. Sounds yeah. awesome. And we do at lunch, you know, like you'd go in the morning, like the schedule was pretty cool. Like, you know, you're up at 6.30 in the van by 7.30, um, at the lake by 7.45, someone's on the water by 7.50. And yeah. like, you know, all day, every day, we'd break for lunch, take an hour break, and then you're right back out. And uh, it was awesome. What, so, kind of, what kind of boat you guys got there? Or boats, we had I guess. all kinds of boats. And so I think we had every kind of boat at, at one point. Like we, we, when the camp was first bought, they had to deal with nautiques. Um, and so we had, you know, the ski nautiques and, um, and those. And then we had some Mastercrafts. Um, that was my first boat sponsor was Mastercraft. Um, our first wakeboard boat that we ever had was the MB B-52 bomber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude. All black. Uh, it had a pylon. It had, like, the neoprene um, interior. It was, like, an experimental. Like, they didn't do vinyl. They did, like, wetsuit material on the seats. It was wild. It was a wild boat. <laughs> but it was, like, the first w real wakeboard boat that we had that was an open bow that wasn't a closed bow. And yeah you know, not a, not a ski boat. So Mastercraft, how's, how's that happen? And so, like I said, when I was young, like my dad was doing a lot of this stuff. And so I think that it was a relationship of, we were running, we were trying to figure out what boats we were going to run at the camp that year. Cause my dad would like, we were going through some boats cause we were having, um, you know, 17 to yeah. 18 people at the camp every week running three or four boats. Um, so he's turning boats over constantly. And so they were, trying to figure out where they were going to go and which boats we were going to be using. And I think he had worked out a deal with, uh, with Mastercraft to get a handful of them. And, um, it just kind of worked out that I was looking for a boat sponsor. I was like at that pivotal point where I might need one. Yeah. Um, and they needed a younger rider. So there I was, but it was awesome because, you know, parks and Shane were on Mastercraft back then, Nick and Jules, um, there was a Zane was on, you know, on Mastercraft. So it was a, it was a pretty cool sponsor. And they were running the tour back then too. Oh correct? yeah. So yep. yeah. Yeah. That's kind yeah. Of that cool. was two, I think it was 2000, um, that I signed with them. It was a couple years that I rode for them. So speaking of board sponsors, you said you're on Hyperlight for a little bit. 
when does CWB come into the picture? Um, so they came into the picture. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I rode my first year on tour on Hyperlight. So 2001 was my first year on the Pro Tour. Um, and they, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It might have been my first two years. Maybe 2002. Yeah, I think it was 2003 that I signed with uh, with CWB. Um, it was just one of those deals that like Hyperlight was going a direction. They had like a huge team. You know, they had a huge team when I signed with them, but then they had like a certain type of, they had just signed Byerly. They had just signed, you know, Danny was on Hyperlight. They had um, JD, like they had all these guys. And then there was like an image thing because of Byerly where they were like looking for the guys that were like a little bit more core. And I don't think that I was that guy, you know, I, it, I, I always had like a pretty clean cut look and like, you know, back then probably even a little kooky and, uh, you know, they were just like, yeah, I don't think that there's no future for you here yeah. at Hyperlite. So that ended and like, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a rough ending for me or anything like that. It was just, you know, this door closed and then, went out looking for something else and CWB was they were not a brand that I was excited to ride for at that time um they didn't have like the coolest image in the world but Reed was riding for them um and we already had a little bit of a relationship with them because of Reed already riding for them um when he was doing junior men's and all that um so I talked to the team manager talked to the the guys and they promised that they would uh change some of their graphics and that they would you know make me a board and all that okay stuff, so, so yeah talks of your own pro model board and stuff yeah, like that yeah they didn't like it, it was one of those things that are like you know obviously you're gonna have to put your time in but like that's what we want to do like we want to you know get you on the team and eventually get you your own board and you know i was like dude even even if i don't have my own board like you guys have got to do something about these ads and these graphics and like you know i'm i'm i might not be the coolest dude in the world but certainly better than this so for someone who wasn't around back then i mean i was just a young pup back then what was so i mean why were they so kooky what was like i mean besides the graphics i guess what, what was so bad about it i think it was just like cheesy marketing like che cheesy ads like you know like there was back then there was like a big push for super aggressive stuff like you know like when you're flipping through the magazine you've got you know brands like black flies and gator boards and Arnett and like all these guys that are like putting out like pretty hardcore looking ads and then you flip the page and it's CWB with like just a bright yellow background with Highlighted. cheesy you know like tribal CWB logo and it's just like not it looks like someone just threw it together on paint for you know five minutes and it, it just wasn't very cool but like you know that's not what they were trying to be either so it it, it just was what it was yeah Definitely. So I got a uh, early Patreon question from Chase Andrews. Yeah. Um, so if you are interested in supporting the podcast, joining the Patreon is the best way to do so. Um, thank you to everyone who is on that Patreon. Um, so we've got a question from Chase Andrews, and, and this is talking about your board. So he, he said it's not necessarily a question, but he wants to hear about the Marius, the name, the unique design, leather on a wakeboard, question mark, question mark. So kind of, yeah, kind of run through, I guess, how that happened and all the ins and outs of you know, the board. Yeah. yeah, so as I like you know, it's fast forwarding a couple of years, but like, as we got to the point of, of getting to design a board, which was honestly one of the coolest things that, uh, that I was ever a part of in the wakeboard industry. Like I had to do a lot of things, but designing that first board was definitely a highlight. And back then, you know, I don't know how it is now, but, uh, that was like, you knew that you made it like, that was like the, the one thing that, you know, you could identify yourself as being a, a big part of the industry was getting your own board. And, uh, so I was just amped and stoked to do it. And, uh, yeah, so we, they asked me, Doug Cannon was the guy that designed the board. Um, he called me and asked, um, you know, what do you, what do you envision for a board? Like what, what are stuff that you think that you want rocker line, you know, that kind of stuff, overall shape. And then he made a handful of them in different, different rocker lines, um, different widths, um, a couple different like top features and bottom features and then basically just brought them all down to the house and it was cool like I still have some of the the original prototypes and we would we would go out like first we would select a rocker line so we would ride all the boards and 
pick a rocker line and you'd have no fin like there was no bottom features at all no fins no channels no no anything just a blank board with just a rocker line so we'd go ride them all and kind of go through a list and say all right what does this one do good what does this one do not good and kind of eliminate them um and then once we found one that was good then we'd go to the next step and he would take bondo and pieces of wood and start building channels on the board and you know all right let's try this see if it works and we'd go out and ride it again and you know wait for the bondo to dry real quick and and head back out and so it would take i think we spent maybe a week um kind of doing that going back and forth until we found one that that we were happy with and that we liked and it had a bunch of stuff on it that no one had really done before we did um v tech was uh first for the marius um, where the tip and tail actually had like a different rocker line. So you've got your rocker that's going tip to tail, but then we had one from edge to edge um, on the, you know, took up the, the nose and the tail for the first like 18 inches. It was like a little V in there because um, the board was so wide. Like I knew that I wanted a really wide board. I rode, um, I rode a board called the O'Brien Fatty uh, a long time ago when I was growing up. Um, that was very similar to like the the Scort, you know, like the Scort was a short, wide board, and then the Brian Fatty was like way wider, and it wasn't like a super popular board, but I remember how much kick that thing felt like I got, so I was like, I want to try a super wide board and see if that works. Yeah. So. So where'd the name come from? It's my middle name. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So Mari's my middle name, and it was kind of like a. Uh, you know, I was a huge Sean Murray fan. He named his board the Belmont, which is his middle name. And uh, I was like, we couldn't come up with a name. Like, they they were throwing names at me. And I was like, no, I don't like any of those. <laughs> you remember any of them? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. They were bad. Uh, wellies, I thought they were bad. But uh, they, uh, you know, I, I said, why don't we do the Marius? And at first, no one knew what it was. And they were like, no. And I was like, well, it's just my middle name. Like, it's hard to screw that up. And they finally said, all right, we'll do it. That works if you got a cool middle name. If you don't have a cool middle name, like my middle name's Alan, that would not. That's Dude, not I think that Alan, that Alan would be a sick word. <laughs> I don't uh, know if I, that. I, li- I like it. I like it. <laughs> so leather on a wakeboard? Yeah, I mean, why not? Why not a little patch of leather, something nice? I don't. I don't know. I don't know how that thing ended up on there. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to set it set it apart a little bit, I guess. That's right. It look cool. You know, a little texture. Yeah, it gives you a little texture, a little stomp pad for when you're. Uh, you know, taking your photo off. Yeah, you, you, you did a lot of one footers. Yeah, I was big into the one footers. <laughs> yeah, real big into those. Uh, so, I mean, you, you kind of ran through it, but what was some of the important input that you you gave to the you know like that you thought was important when designing a board? I mean, that that was the cool thing about my process. You know, I don't know if everyone has the same experience when they're designing their board, but like mine was hands on. Like we we designed that board. Like when when I say Doug flew down to the house and like we spent you know, a week, like we spent every waking minute working on that board. Like he was out there sanding stuff down and we had, dude, he would bring like these toolboxes full of all these, you know, sticky fins that he could put on. Cause back then you were doing molded fins. And so it was a quick way to like, you know, put some molded fins on and not have to worry about bolting fins on. And we tried so many different things and it was, it was so much fun. Like, yeah, it, it was, it was a blast. And we did that so we did the Marius went through, I think three shape revisions. So we did that. We got to do that three different times. So that was pretty cool. That sounds like a lot. I mean, that would be a lot of fun. Imagine designing your own board. It's one thing to have your name on it. It's another one to have a lot of input in. Well, the whole, what. the whole process is super cool. Cause you know, you're, you're with the designer, you get to, you know, you get to design the board and then even after the board's designed, then you're talking to the graphics guys and, and trying to figure out what graphics are going to be on the board. And that's a whole other animal too. And that, that one you end up, I feel like you end up being less involved with because they've got so many inputs. The shape of the board, they kind of rely on you a little bit because they're like, you know, as long as it's something that they that's going to fit into the line, if it's, you know, going to work from a sales standpoint, then they're happy. Yeah. But the graphics thing, it's like, you know, every brand's got their own little graphics guys that they want what they want and it's got to fit in with their deal and, and they're involving the sales teams and all that. So uh, we... we some of my most uh, wordy emails exchanges back and forth were regarding graphics and what we should do with graphics. If I were to say one thing, I would say just listen to the damn rider. When it comes to everything about the board, the graphics, the design, just listen to the guy who's riding it. I mean, 
Yeah, they, they usually know a lot more than you think they do. Yeah, I mean, yes and no, because like I definitely think that there's definitely some. I guess that's true. There's definitely some 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 guys out there in the sales department that are like, dude, you're not going to sell any of those if you do that on board. Um, so there's definitely some some insights there, and there's every there's so many things to consider. Like you think it's easy, you know, with skateboarding and and those things. Like you can change that kind of stuff. Like you know, it's super easy. But with uh, with a wakeboard, once you like start printing those graphics and you're stuck with them for a year it's it can be it better pretty, be good it better be good yeah yeah definitely uh so what happened to cwb because you were with them for a long time right yeah a long time so i'm um, curious so it you know it's it's a long that's a super long story of of my relationship with cwb because it was a great relationship like i loved riding for cwb like some of the best times that we had um, in my career was filming some of our CWB uh, YouTube videos. Like we created like a little Venmo or Vimeo um, account back in the day and um, YouTube and we would make, you know, these stupid funny videos and get the whole team together and we would have a blast, man. So that's what I'm kind of referring to is like yeah. thousand foot wakeboard rope, boat gas etiquette, jet ski PSA. There were tons of these videos. So fun. Funny. And they look like they were fun to yeah. do and like they some of these did some numbers. Thousand foot wakeboard rope is almost at a million views. Yeah. So what happened? So they had a guy that was our team manager, uh, Steve Bates, that was filming all those things. And he was kind of using that platform to build his his own um, marketing business. And he was, you know, he started a business called Black Oak um, and he was filming all that stuff. And I think that like, as he started to get better and started to do more stuff he just got to a point where it wasn't financially worth it for him to put all of the time and the investment into making those videos and like because it was a lot of time and effort like we would go and spend you know a couple days at a time trying to come we'd get the whole team together over at zane's house and try to put those videos together and a lot of it was like fly by the seat of your pants stuff like we we were like what are we doing today and we would go to lowe's and like walk around Lowe's and we're like oh look it's a steering wheel like do you think that we could hook this to a rope and like ride with it and and we'd go I don't know let's try it and that's how most of those videos came about was us walking around Walmart or walking around Lowe's or just being bored um and so I think that you know it got I don't know the whole ins and outs of it I'd stay out of the out of that side but it, it just got to a point where it wasn't probably finance. CWB couldn't afford to make them anymore. And Steve was busy doing other things. And uh, also the riders too. Like there was, there was a, like a group of like me and Andrew and Corey Bradley um, and Derek Grassman. Like we were probably like the core guys that were c c coming up with the ideas and the content. And once we started doing other stuff too, it just kind of was like, Oh, you know, there's not enough guys to keep yeah. doing this. Yeah. I guess what, when I was a kid, like I had a CWB board and I think I probably got it because some of those videos, because I just thought like thousand foot wakeboard rope, like these guys, uh, that's cool. Uh, it's just unique. Like it gave CWB like kind of an identity yeah. that I could like, you know, people could follow and understand that's what this brand is. It's these goofy guys doing this yeah, you know, yeah. weird, crazy things. But then I feel like once you kind of stop that and maybe this is a bigger conversation, but like the brand loses its identity. Yeah. Nobody's really going to buy the product as much anymore because there's no identity like yeah, you know, and I think that that's like when I refer to you know CWB being kooky back in the day. I think that that's kind of what the problem was with that brand always was that they struggled with their identity, like that you know Liquid Force and Hyperlite and Ronix and like all those brands like kind of like have their vision and they have it and they they run with it regardless of what is happening in sales and they kind of like use the identity to build around their sales. Whereas I think that you know, CWB used sales to find their identity. And then if it wasn't working, they would quickly abandon it and, and push it to the side. Yeah. And so it was tough, man. Like we would always want to do stuff and it just sometimes didn't work out and didn't have the money to do it. What's your uh, favorite Connolly tube? Oh man. Uh, I got uh, 45 of them in my boat. House I was right talking now. to Cody on the cat and he was like, you got to ask him what his favorite tube Dude, is. Dude, I have so many tubes. So I've, uh, I've now become the, uh, the official uh, Conley tube tester. Uh, so they send me a bunch of tubes to test and I take my kids out on for a rip and, uh, and test tubes. So I've what's, got, the, uh, what's the day rate on a tube tester? Is it pretty high? It's yeah, pretty well, good. It's all the, all the tubes you can handle. <laughs> 
see if you're in Orlando or where, where you guys at where you're at. I'm out in Claremont. If you're in Claremont, you see a bunch of tubes on Facebook Marketplace. That might be. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so you got you got 45 or something. I, like that? Dude, I have no idea how many tubes I have. It's a lot. It's too many. It's too, too many, many tubes. Too, too many tubes. Um, so speaking of sponsors, uh, when did you sign with Supra? Because you said you were ma- with Mastercraft for a little bit, but you've been with Supra for what two decades now? I mean, yep. it's, okay. yeah, j- just just past 20 years. Um, so I signed with them in 03. So I rode for Mastercraft. I think that I rode for them from like 99 to probably 2001. It was just a couple years. Um, and it was awesome. Super fun being on that team, um, going to the photo shoot. That was like my first experience of like going to photo shoots, like big, big production photo shoots. Obviously we had done them in the backyard and had Josh Letchworth and all those guys in the tubes and done all that. But like going and like being a part of a, a Tom King photo shoot where there's big photo boats and, and it's a Mastercraft is, you know, very corporate and they put on a big production. Um, so being a part of those was cool. Um, and then I rode for, I quit riding for them, um, and rode for that, uh, Regal sessions for a year. Yeah. Yeah. When they, when they were designing their boat, my dad was a big part of helping put that boat together. And that's probably why I left Mastercraft was that he was, it was a real conflict of interest of him, you know, working on that boat and me still living at their house and, and Mastercraft wasn't stoked about that deal at all. Um, so rode for them for a year and then, um, got approached by Supra and decided to do that. So that happened in 03 and Supra has been like, you know, like the best brand ever. Like I love that brand. They're the people that work at Supra, the owners, um, everything about that company is, uh, is fantastic. They're, they're super cool. Super cool. So, I mean, you, you've been with them for two decades now. How is your, I mean, obviously you started as an athlete yep. and then you transition into, I guess we can get in the future of what you're doing now, but I mean, I guess just kind of walk through that relationship, how it's changed from athlete to what you do now. Yeah. So, um, I mean, honestly it just changed. Uh, I was still like on the pro team up until like two years ago. Um, so I'm now like, uh, an ambassador, um, and not really a, a part of the pro team anymore, but, uh, that's the cool thing about Superman. It's like, they're such a family based brand. Like the guys that own it, like it's a privately held company. There's a couple of owners um, and they treat everyone that works for them and everyone that's involved with them. Like they're a family member and uh, just got such a good relationship with those dudes. And uh, all the way from the guys that, you know, are running around the factory working on the boats, uh, you know, through the marketing to the sales, like everyone's just awesome. And uh, so it was easy transitions. Like they just, yeah, what do you, what do you want to do now? Like we can easily put you into this role or, you know, they called me the team manager for a long time, but gave me no actual responsibility for the team. Like they're like, yeah, just talk. People would come up to me and they're like, Hey, I heard you're the super team manager. I go, I have no ability to hire you. I have no ability to fire anybody. I don't have any budgets, but sure. I can forward this email. Yeah. yeah. I can certainly put you in touch with someone that would do all those things. Yeah. And so, you know, there's just been different roles and now I'm doing, um, I do a lot of YouTube stuff for them. I do a lot of boat shows, um, a lot of events, and then obviously drive the pro tour. And so um, my list of things that I do for them is long, um, but they just kind of, you know, shift me into different avenues and, and move me around wherever wherever I fit in. Kind of, a, yeah, wears many hats with that. Okay, so before we move on to some other things, Ojo, is that how you say that? O-G-I-O? O-G-O. O-G-O. Yep. Okay, well, that's kind of showing my age. I didn't really know how to say that. Um, you were, you were with them for a little bit, right? Yep. So is that like you're getting paid like full on sponsorship deal or you're just kind of getting some gear from them? Man, I don't actually remember if I got paid by OGO or not. Um, I probably did. It was probably photo incentives. It probably wasn't a salary. Um, the, the, the funny thing about being in the industry for this long and like, you know, I had so many small sponsors that I probably couldn't name them all. Even if I tried, like there was like a lot of, of companies that would come in for a year or two and, uh, you know, set me up with photo incentives and product and, you know, maybe a 150 bucks or 200 bucks here and there. And, um, I always had a hard time. Like I've been with super for so long and I was with Conley for a really long time. Um, but then there was a lot of other brands that like, I had a really hard time holding down a clothing company brand or holding down sunglasses or anything like that. Like I went through tons of them. Like I was with Oakley, Anarchy, Legend, um, Smith. Um, there was probably another one in there too. Um, 
I was with Rusty, Lost, SMP, Synthetic, uh, Running the gamut. Jet Pilot, um, a lot. Why and do you think that is? You just, I mean, I don't know. I think that it was like uh, just image wise like you know marketing wise like i fit in with a little a, a brand for a little while and then it just didn't work out or there was no longevity there and you know a lot of it was companies getting in and out of the industry like smp was in the industry for like 10 minutes and then you know rusty was in the industry for a little while and they still are from a wake surf standpoint yeah. like they make all their wake surfers and stuff but like from a, a clothing sponsorship they don't sponsor guys and so they tried it for a little while and then just Pulled, pulled the plug and didn't do it. Um, same thing happened with Lost. Um, so it was just kind of, you know, moving moving around. When But it's funny because I, like, had, like, two totally different deals. Like, I'm like, you know, people would be like, oh, well, you know, Trevor, just, you know, go wherever the money is. And it's like, no, dude, like, I stayed with the, the brands that wanted to have me. I stayed with them forever. But if they didn't want to have me, then I was, you know, didn't want to be there. That's either. true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you want me, I'll be yeah. here. But if you don't really want me, I'm, yeah. Yeah. See ya, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, aside from before we move on from like older sponsors and stuff, what were obligations like back then? I've asked this to a couple guests, but I'm just curious your your take on, you know, the early days, you know, of the heyday of wakeboarding 2000s. What were the obligations like for sponsors that you had to fulfill? There was a lot of uh, a lot of on the water demo stuff like, you know, it's funny. I was flipping through some old mags um, not that long ago and I came across a Hyperlight Days page and dude it was a full page in the mag. The print was this big and it was showing how many days they did. And I bet they, they had, I bet that there was a hundred different days on that, on that page that was showing how many demos they were going to have for their riders to go to. Um, and all the brands were doing that. And so you would, you know, before and after pro tour events, you were traveling because Back then, we had 10 Pro Tour or 10 King Awake stops, five Pro Tours, Nationals, Worlds, all the IWF events. And so it was a full schedule. And so your obligations were just doing all those things. Like, and it would depend too on what kind of rider you were. Like, there definitely was a little bit of a, of, there wasn't a ton of guys that were doing an all media based because he didn't have that same outlet. Like there wasn't the Instagrams, there wasn't the Facebooks or the YouTubes. And so it was a little bit more difficult. There were guys that were able to do it. Like you've got guys like Colin Wright that were able to, you know, have a career and only film one wakeboard section a year and still was able to make it work. Um, but there was the list of guys that could do that was so short. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of events and then just showing up to, to different, different, demo days and taking people out on the water yeah a lot of boots on the ground type stuff getting people into the sport exactly yeah maybe maybe bring some of that back a little bit i guess there's a maybe there's a reason that people were so into wakeboarding back then i mean yeah other reasons too but well, it, but it's funny because i feel like the we did a lot of those things but i feel like just as many people show up for those things now like if you put one really? if you put one on people love it and they come to them and and yeah it's smaller and there's not as many people um doing those but when you do them, people are into it. And interesting. They, and they love it. That's an interesting take because you've, you've done both sides of it. You're doing it now, you know, and you've done it back then too. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear your take on that. Um, so I think it's time to dive into the LF and Wheel of Questions presented by Liquid Force. All right. The LF and Wheel of Questions. Okay, let's go. So if you want to go ahead and... I say we grab it. Matt spun it up there, but it kind of made Matt's, me nervous that it was going to... That's a little different, you know? Yeah. I like, I like bringing it down. And, okay. Yeah. So Something like this? Something like this is perfect. So, right. yeah, go, go ahead, ahead and... Just uh, giving her a spin. Give her a spin. No. Goat. The goat. goat. Um, uh, male and female, you can go. Male and female. Okay. Uh, Parks Bonifay. Uh, PB, okay. Yep. Parks Bonifay. And then, I mean, I think you got to go Dallas. Yeah. Probably got to go Dallas. A close, close second would probably be Amber Wing. Yeah, yeah, those are two. Yeah, two straight up answers. Yep. And th there's we so we had this. This is pretty funny. We had this conversation uh, last year at our super shoot with uh, with Finn, um, Thomas, myself, and Reed. And so it was me and Reed who have been in the sport forever, 
and Thomas young and Finn cats. that are a little bit newer. Okay, and we asked them to name their top five. Okay. And I was shocked. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? Top five of all time? Top five of all time. I was like, what are you talking what about? What were they thrown out? Just guys that I wouldn't have expected. You know, that like to me being like older and looking at the sport from a lot longer of a perspective, I was like, man, like I need to know where you're coming from on this because I just don't see it. Like I don't know what you're talking about. And we, me and Reed were just like scratching our heads. I'm like, dude, are we this like, are we this old now that like this is what it is now? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Top. I'd, I'd be curious to hear their top five. Maybe if we get Finn in here. I, and I, I, can, I think you need to start asking people. Top five. Yeah. I think you need to start. Let's start right people. now. Let's get give me top five. Top five. So my top five would probably be, um, man, I wish I could remember who we because we we. Beat, you probably don't we, weigh into we, it. We beat this to death for because we, <laughs> we, we, we it was a very quick conversation at the start, and then uh, it turned into like the full week we're talking about this and being like you know we're going to bed at night thinking about how how who's in our top five. But I think that mine was Parks, and this is in no particular order, yeah. but Parks, um, Randall. Uh, pretty sure I had Murray in there. Okay. Rathy. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and Danny. So there's no Byerly there. Nope. There's no Rafter Rome there. Yep. Those are two big ones. Yep. Yeah. You only got five. That's you true. Know, that's a thing. So we, we, we beat this up. And I'm trying to remember if I, because I think I made a couple changes. Because there was guys that I like originally wanted to put in there and then was like, nah, can't do it. And... I think Murray was actually one that probably wasn't in there at the start of the conversation for me, and it might have been a Byerly. Yeah. And then I had to make the switch. It was like, dude, Murray's just like, when you look at his entire career, and then even still to this day, like, I guess it what depends on kind of like what your criteria is. Oh, it totally depends on because for me, is. Raph is like the best one to ever put boots on on a board. Yeah. And do it all. Yeah. But his career is not as long as. Murray's sure you know what I mean like sure. he was he came in and he went out like yeah so yeah it's yeah. interesting to hear yeah and like totally like totally different time eras too because like I feel that way about Parks like to me Parks is the dude that like he doesn't even need boots and he's still the goat like you you just give that guy a handle and some water and just let him do whatever he's going to do and he's unbelievable at everything um the guy's like just so talented it's crazy and I feel that way about Rathy Danny, like all those guys are pretty much in the same. Yeah. But Roth, it Roth is right up there. I mean, that's it's tough not to have him on there also. He's he's unbelievable. You only got five though, like you said. I know. You only so got five. I had another one on here that I wanted to ask you about. Because you've been in the wakeboarding industry for a long time. You've seen a lot of technology come and go. Yep. What's the what's the goofiest piece of wake tech you might have you might have seen over the years? Oh man, there's so much of it. There's so much goofy tech. Um, so are we talking like board gimmicky? Are so we I was going to keep it to board gimmicky, but then I figured, well, I mean, why should we just limit it to boards? It should be, you know, boats, anything, any sort of, there's so many tech. There's so many, like, I think that like, you know, those, those hyperlight jib channels that they put on the board for a little while were pretty, pretty bad. You know, the idea of like having like an up raised, thing going down the entire center of your board was was pretty awful um that byerly flow through board where it had like holes in the rails where the water was supposed to like flow through seemed like it was pretty bad <laughs> um i mean dude like I th i'm pretty sure that there was handles that someone was making to put on i definitely the, saw that yeah, somewhere. yeah grab handles yeah like there was there was an actual some people grab. could probably benefit from that but yeah It'd be easier to reach some of those things. It'd be nice, you know, or, or even just know where you're supposed to grab it's it. Not, I grab you know, the handle, all, baby. All, you, you, it's nose. I promise. I grab the handle. It's right there. I didn't. I didn't slip that tendy in there. Uh, yeah, that, I mean that's a good couple. Yeah, there, there, right there. there were some bad ones, but like wakeboarding, like there was a long time where wakeboarding was trying to find itself as a sport, and so there was so much stuff that was gimmicky. Like we had that that additional pylon. I don't know if you ever saw that thing. Um, I think I saw Zane use it once or something. Yeah, so I can't remember what they called it, like the sky pole or something like that. Yeah. 
Dude, it was like another 10 feet taller and it was so tall that they had to put like a little sail on it so that it would like help catch wind so that it wouldn't like tip the boat over. I mean, it was bad. It, you know, super, that sounds pretty fun super, though. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I mean, extra I, 10 feet. I, I never got to ride on it. Um, you know, flying tubes. Those were pretty sick though. Pretty sick, but like they almost killed a couple people. Yeah, but that's what makes it kind of sick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I get it. So, I get it. There's, yeah. there's a lot of things. They had they had some goofy ones, man. It was like I feel like in the earlier days it was like golf, where like if if people in golf will buy anything that will just help them totally. get a better score, and like industries go through that where they're like we're just gonna try every little piece of quirky tech. Totally, there, someone's gonna buy it. Yeah, there was a there was when I was flipping through that magazine, I noticed an ad too. There was a platform um, that had a ballast tank built into the platform. Somebody so like, was, I think Clark Davis was talking about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool too. Yeah. Probably didn't work that well. Otherwise, we maybe would have seen it. But yeah, it's yeah, I think concept. that there's other things that you can put down there that maximize that 150 <laughs> pounds a little bit better. But you know, it took a while to figure that out because back in the day, we would try to put anything in the boat that weighed anything. Yeah, you know, like if it had any amount of weight to it, we were throwing it in the boat. So, speaking of weight, um, well, we can go ahead and put this uh, liquid right. force. We have questions back. Thanks, to liquid force. Yeah, th thanks, LF, for that. So, speaking of weight in your boat, where did you get all the lead? You know. In, in your boat dude so I got I got lead from all over the place I've got I've still got lead plates that I made from uh, attacking every tire shop in the Claremont Groveland radius trying to get their tire leads and I would just melt it all down and make my own plates um, got a bunch of uh, of the um, the lead wake wake ballast bags and then I've got some of Jerry Nunn's uh, wake lead plates that these things are probably close to 30 years old now um, Rusty bought him off of Jerry when he was getting out of wake and Rusty had him forever and had his X star back in the day loaded down with these things. And then, um, he got to a point where he didn't need them anymore. So I bought them off of him. So I've got all these, uh, I heard you had old, a super hodgepodge old. of weight in your yeah, boat. So yeah, yeah, I've got a lot of them. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, speaking of boat riding, what's, uh, what's your setup these days? So board size, rope length, speed, et cetera. Yeah, so I've got, um, I'm riding uh, a Conley, um, I can't, it's called the Standard, it was Twelker's board, but I don't think it's called the Standard anymore now that Twelker hasn't been with them for a long time. They don't boards anymore, do they? No. Conley? Uh, no, well, yeah, kind of. They do? Yeah. They don't have a team, though. a board, they, nobody no board. on the board side no, of the team. No board but team. But they probably still have boards. Yeah, they still have boards. Costco or whatever, they're going to find them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I still have, I still have like last year's board or whatever, whatever the last year was that they were making these. Um, and I'm riding that. It's a 139, um, which I would like for it to be a little bigger, but they don't, they don't make them any bigger. Um, and then probably 75 feet ish. Okay. At 23 and a half, probably, or 23, two, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. Still getting back there at a decent speed. Yeah, well, I have to go faster. I, I don't understand how these guys ride so slow. Like, that's the one thing that I cannot believe on tour that these dudes are riding as slow as they are. I don't know why. So what speeds on tour are you seeing? Um, I mean, got, like, a couple of the guys now, like some of the ditch, like the ditch brothers will go a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when we do the team event, Dallas oh, is always like two miles an hour faster than everybody else, which is wild. Yeah. Um, it feels like we're flying but uh, yeah, they're they're like I would say the average speed is like twenty two and a half. But even to me, that seems super slow. And then once you get like down towards twenty two, that's starting to feel really slow. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you got a bigger board, shorten the rope up. You're all right. Yeah. Wakes so so darn big doesn't matter. Oh, anyways. they're huge. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. The wakes are ginormous now. Uh, so I want to touch on a. Like, I mean, you've had some video parts, some video sections. I've, I was cruising through some of your stuff, um, and I watched Drive and or like you're kind of it was like a, a two for section and drive yep. um and i saw some rail riding at the end i hadn't seen this in a long time it was pretty sick it was like a flat up rail and then there was a tap like a big box in the middle and then a down flat at the end yeah i, was, I just I just wanted to give that a little love it was pretty sick i'll oh, put the thanks. clip in thanks yeah that that was a fun rail to build so uh me and gabe um shared a section in that and uh that was kind of they they gave us a budget. Um, both Gabe and I both enjoyed riding rails, um, and they gave us a budget to, to come up with something. So me and Gabe sat down and drew that one up, um, and it was fun. 
it was a fun. So little that was bit. custom just for you too, and that. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah. We literally just used it for that, and then took it down. So I think he got a he got a cover out of it too. Like he, he got a wakeboard mag cover out of it. Um, yeah, Gabe Gabe was sick. Gabe was a real sick rider. So you did like riding rails back then? Quite a loved bit. Loved it. Yeah, loved it. What was it I about did, it? I mean, we had so many rails at the house. Like we would constantly build rails. Um, I loved hitting big gaps. Like we would always have big gaps. Like there, there's a video that you probably couldn't find because it's not on the internet anywhere. But there was a video called Silly. Um, that one of my best friends um, in the wayboard industry made. He made two videos. He made one called Exposed and one called Silly. Um, and that Silly section was the best section that I ever had. It was like the only opportunity that I ever had to like really work hard at at making a section. Um, and we set up the a kicker and had like a 60-foot gap to an A-frame. Um, and that was wild. That was a lot of fun. But I like loved doing that stuff. Yeah. It, it was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah I, I saw on facebook there's this guy i forget his name and he posts in like some wakeboard facebook group that i you know peruse sometimes and he was wondering like where did these big rails go because back in you know these days we're talking about there was a lot of boat riders were riding rail setups that they would make and stuff like that and i just thought it was an interesting conversation because in a sense it makes sense that it's gone because cable parks have now come into play with you know legitimized rail riding that you can go and show up with legitimized boards for it yeah but it was still there was still something cool about riding the wake, and then you have a rail in the front yard, and you cut over, hit it, keep riding. Yeah, it's a uh, it's so much harder to to hit rails on the boat, and it's a lot harder to build them. It's a lot more inconvenient, I think. Um, you know, just even when we had rails on the tour, like it was such a pain for those guys to to bring the rails and and do that whole deal. Um, so I think that's just kind of why it went away. But it's wild to see like what happened to rail riding um, throughout time. Because, like I said, back in the day, like we were just trying to f- see what kind of gaps we could do. Like it was like a, a just see how dangerous you could get and make some kind of huge jump. Like even you know JD's stunt junkies yeah, deal, yeah. and like that's what that's what it was to us. Is like let's get a big ass ramp and try to gap something. That's what we would do. Yeah, it was sick. It definitely made some for some very enjoyable and uh, and wild clips. Yeah, no doubt about that. All right, so I think we dive into a little bit of coaching because looking at your Yeti Cup, wake coach Trev. Yeah. So you've you've been coaching for a while now. Forever, correct? forever. So I've got some. I typically I want to. I like to ask anyone on here who has done coaching or is coaching some. You know, not basic questions, but just kind of poke your brain on you know, coaching wakeboarding. Cause I think it's a, you know, people can learn a lot. So I want to hit on the importance of the fundamentals because at the beginning you mentioned, maybe you didn't skip them. <laughs> you kind of skipped them straight, skip which, them. you know, it is fun. I'm not going to lie yeah. to do some tricks, but like c- kind of hit on the importance of learning the fundamentals it's, that you've seen now. Oh, it's so important. And I didn't realize how important it was until like a couple years down the road. Cause like, so I, like I said, I'm, I'd learned whirly birds super early. And then um, when I learned whirly fives, I could land them and I could do them, but I couldn't get it consistent. Like I would, I was like, dude, I can't get this consistent. And then chromobes, I tried chromobes forever, like probably a year, um, trying chromobes and landing the exact same way every single time and couldn't land it. And then I finally figured out I couldn't land wrapped. I couldn't land blind. Like I was like, dude, I can't do a toe side three and land wrapped. I can't do a backside 180 and land wrapped. And that's why I can't land these. Um, and so I spent the next couple of years like beating those to death. Um, every time I would get up um, inside out backside 180 and then cut back across and do an inside out switch backside 180. And I just beat those to death. Um, but that I say all that to say that it's super important and you definitely should not skip the basics. Um, it is fun to, to learn your first invert, but being able to have the right amount of control and understand line tension and understand how that works in your favor. Um, when you're landing, um, like I get, you know, people that ask, you know, how, how do I land this trick that I've been trying forever? And a lot of it probably has to do with a a step that you skipped that you're just not quite good enough at that. Like you can do the trick physically, but you don't understand the line tension or you don't understand the handle pass or you don't understand that aspect. Um, so definitely, you know, learning the basics and, you know, grabs are one thing, but like 
you know, you probably should learn a heel side three or a toe side three before you start working on flips. Like it's very important to know how to pass the handle. It's cool to be able to do that flip, but then when you want to go further, you, you need those basics. Yeah, I think that's, that's like such a weird double-edged sword because like the one thing when people want to wakeboard, I was, my next question was what's the most requested trick to learn? What is it? Um, well, I don't know. Pro- I mean, it's first inverts. Usually, you know, it's your first invert. It's, it's you know, back roll or tantrum. Yeah. Um, you know, it, nowadays I, I tend to try to push people to a toe side back roll. Um, I feel like that one's easier to understand the rotation and easier to, cause it, your first invert, you're just trying to figure out how to get upside down. You're trying to figure out how to throw your body and get upside down. And then once that kind of clicks, then you know, you can, you can figure out the other ones from there. Um, and the toe side back roll is a pretty easy one to, to figure out how to get upside down. Yeah. My point being was like, so yeah, a lot of people want to learn how to flip cause that's like the cool thing, yeah. which it is cool to go upside down and come back on your feet is an awesome thing to do on a wakeboard. But I mean, and if you want to do that, definitely do it. That's what I did. I didn't learn the fundamentals and you didn't really learn a lot of fundamentals no. either, but, but I would say make the fundamentals fun if you can. I mean, make the 180s and the 360s, learn how to do them, make it fun. It doesn't have to be a boring like process of like, yeah. okay, I got to hammer out these fundamentals. Like it's a trick, just like everything else is a trick. So yeah. dude, even like, even learning, you know, I try to push people to riding switch a lot too. Like learn how to learn how to ride switch, learn how to take off switch toe side. Like I didn't learn how to do a switch toe side, anything until I, I bet I was a year on pro tour before I even ever hit the wake switch toe side. You know, like it was like something I'm like, I don't need to do this at all. And then once you get to a certain point in your riding, you're like, I'm really shutting down like an entire category of tricks because I don't know how to do this. Yeah. So then you got to go back and try to figure it out. And it's never fun to go backwards. So just check those things off the box as you go. What would you say you like about coaching? It did. It's the, it's the feeling of, of letting somebody experience something new. Um, you know, that I think Matt touched a little bit about it on his podcast that I just listened to the other day, but the, the feeling of, um, being able to share a first opportunity with someone or watch them just succeed in something that they've been trying, um, the smile on their face, it, it's so gratifying. And like, it, it's honestly more fun than, than doing it yourself. If you, if yeah. you being able to share that, cause I love wakeboarding. Like I, I, I love this sport. Um, I've, I've loved it since the first time that I touched a wakeboard and, uh, being able to, to have young kids, um, learn how to get up for the first time. And you like, you don't even know, you know, like I, I just took a kid out the other day, um, that was unplanned. Like I, a, a buddy was driving by on his boat and he called me to ask me how to get this kid up. He's like, he's never, he, he, we're wake surfing and he's never wakeboarded. He's never wake surfed. He's nine years old. He wants to, to get up. How do I help him? And I said, just come pick me up. I'll come help you real quick. And I was, they were going to try to have him wake surf. I'm like, let's put a wakeboard on him real quick. Like if he's never gotten up, let's just, you know, and it, the water was cold. It was windy. Um, it was like a rainy day. It wasn't super nice out. And so he only spent maybe 10 minutes out there. He was freezing, tiny little kid, he, long story, but he only got up for maybe two seconds, like got up, rode a little bit, fell. That was it. Like he never even got up to full speed. Um, but like I said, didn't try very long. Um, I was just like, okay, yep. Sweet. Drop me back off. The next day they called me and they were like, dude, he won't stop talking about this. Like he's like so amped up, like he's just fired up about it. And that's the kind of stuff like you, like to me, it was like, oh yeah, like he did okay. Like he didn't, you know, fully get up, uh, you know, maybe next time he'll, you know, get up and be able to ride. But to him, he was like, dude, I did it. Like that was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Cause it is. Yeah. It it's is awesome. It, it's, it's hard to beat sharing that with people. Yeah. So you just mentioned that that's the first time. So when somebody gets a boat and I don't know how many people are listening that just got a boat, but if you are, this, I mean, this might be good, good to hear. Or even if you know someone that has, if you, someone gets a boat, whether it's a tow boat or a pontoon and they're interested in doing water sports, mm-hmm. what is the number one, where should they start? What should be the first thing you do, you know, towed water sports wise? Um, probably getting up on a wakeboard. Um, you think? I think so. You know, uh, it, well, it depends on what, and it's, it depends on what you're doing. So like if you're a young kid that's never done anything, yeah. okay. Um, I wouldn't start them there. I'd start them laying on an e-board and just, or a wake surfer or anything like just to feel skipping know, across the water. Yeah. And like go idle speed, like, 
just kind of get familiar with being back there, how the rope works, like, because there's a lot of stuff that's happening when you're in the water. Like, kids, too, you don't realize how scary it is for someone that's never been out there when they fall and the boat's gone, you know, and they're just sitting there in the water. You know, maybe they've flipped over onto their stomach. They're uncomfortable. They don't know how to swim with the board on. Um, it's intimidating. And so kind of taking all of those elements away and just using like the, I, I don't know what that board's called. They have like a zupper yeah, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Like that thing's sick. Like that's exactly what a lot of people need as a first time, get your kid comfortable um, in the water. But like if you're an adult that has like any kind of background in anything athletic or you've snowboarded before or skateboarded before, then I would just throw you a wakeboard and say, let's, let's see if we can get you up on this thing first. And then, you know, most of those people are trying to wake surf anyway. And so wake, getting up on a wakeboard is easier just because you're locked in and you don't have to worry about the board being in the right position and all that. So I always try to get people up on a wakeboard first and then transition them to a surfer if that's what they really want to do. What would you set that rope length at for the first time wakeboarder? Um, very short. Okay. Very short, like wake surf length. So um, I think that's one of the biggest things that people still are, you know, have a misconception about yeah. is, just, okay, we're going to start trying to wakeboard put you out there 70 feet yeah no <laughs> yeah make the angle of pulling you up as steep as you can exactly yeah like almost so short like the in a, it so if i'm if i'm teaching someone that's never done it before i'll set the rope probably to like 20 feet where yeah. it's not like that way that if they do because a lot of people will get up their first try like if you explain it right and they understand the mechanics they'll get up within one or two tries and it's not that big a deal um sometimes they don't understand it and they're fighting it and they're straightening their legs and, and pushing against the board and that um, those people you definitely have to have it as short as possible so that they can kind of get that upward pull and understand how their upper body and their lower body work through the process um, and so i'll try it at like 20 or 30 feet so that way if they do get up they actually can ride and they can go for a little bit because that's what the feeling and the excitement that you're trying to get if they're too close to the boat they'll get up but it's so hard to ride right there with the you know the yeah. water coming out of the back of the boat and they have to get outside of the rooster tail and um, a lot of times they'll get up but they literally can't ride there because there's so much going on um, so i'll only do that if i have to um, but it usually 20 or 30 feet will be where I'll start people. Yeah. And then once they get the hang of that, you can bring them into wake surf. And then once they wake surf, they can go back to wakeboarding again. Exactly. For a little bit. Exactly. Uh, so I think now it's a good time to do a segment presented by Driftline. It's called Deserve Some Love. So Driftline makes wetsuit line board shorts that are perfect for those spring sessions on the water. Uh, I rock these board shorts and I'm a huge fan because you're going to wear board shorts anyway. So you might as well have a little bit more protection and a little bit, you know, keep a little bit warmer down there. Uh, if you want to try a pair, hit the link in the show notes. Uh, you get 15% off your order with the code GRAB15. So what is uh, what is deserve some love? Basically, is anybody, whether they're in the water sports industry, um, and if there's nobody that you can think of there, then you know anybody in your life that you know didn't get the love they deserved? Oh, man. We could sit here for an hour, and uh, and I could go through go through people. Um, so for, for my life and my career, there's a long list of guys that – were a part of my journey that would never get any recognition for it at all because they were just coaches at our camp and they were the guys that I was riding with all the time and like a lot of them were only in wakeboarding for a short season like they were you know trying to figure out if they were going to be able to be any good or they were coming down because the way that we ran the camp was that we would have coaches come in and that was their trade-off they'd get to lodge for free stay for free and ride and exchange for coaching and so we'd get a lot of guys that were trying to figure it out and see if they could make something out of it and it, it might work it might not um and the list of guys that didn't make it is way longer than the guys that yeah. did um but there's guys like uh, mark poirier kevin kentel uh, brad buskis dave tazuki um ian Liu. Um, AJ Haynes, like Colt Leonard, there, there's, I could name 50 guys probably if I sat here long enough and thought about all these guys that pulled me at the camp that we would, they'd help build rails and they were never in the spotlight whatsoever. They were just, you know, there helping out and, and being a part of stuff at the yeah. camp. So all, I owe a lot to all those guys. Yeah. They, they put in the hours with me and, and I got to benefit from it. Yeah, it's, it definitely is. I mean, in any sport, it's like there's a lot of people who are trying to make it to this very small part where you're getting paid and kind of living the life. And 
it's like with any sport, you know, NFL, NBA, all that. Like it just as as the level goes up, the pool shrinks and the pool shrinks until you just gotta select a few. But yeah, there's people all along the way that are you know helping out and trying yeah. out. So yeah, so many, so many. And then like there's the there's the obvious ones, man. Like that, the, you know, once you dive into thanking people and showing people love and stuff, it's yeah. like I couldn't do any of this without my wife and you know all, all that stuff. But there's a there's a long list. Yeah, the the guys should know who they are. But if I if I didn't say your name, I'm that's sorry, a good bet though. But, I mean, yeah, yeah rattled off quite a few there. Yeah. So I say we talk PWT, Pro Wakeboard Tour. Yeah. So what is your involvement in the PWT currently? Um. So right now I'm just driving. Um. You know they they you know they ask me my opinions on things in the off season and and all that. But um, mostly mostly just the driver at this point. But I do share my share my opinions and share my thoughts when it comes to formats and stuff like that. Okay. So what, what would you say is the hardest part about being the driver for the PWT? It's not really anything hard about it at all. It's just fun. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's just fun. <laughs> like it, it, it's a, uh, you know, for me, I've been in a boat my whole life and driving the boat. And so I know what the guys want. Um, I feel comfortable in any of the lakes that we go in that, you know, there's a couple situations where I'd rather not drive double ups in certain certain lakes and all that stuff just because it's tight and you're not you don't feel like you're giving the rider, you know, exactly what they want or it's just very challenging to get them exactly what they want. Um, and so I've you know, those are the situations where you're, you know, kind of white knuckled and but for the most part, man, it's it's pretty easy and it's it's just fun. It's fun driving the tour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um if you had unlimited resources. What might you change about the PWT? Um, I mean, unlimited resources. I would, you know, have X Games be every every stop. You know, you'd have multiple sports. You'd have, you know, big music stuff going on. Like basically, what we used to have because we had those. Like we, if you were to go back and and look at like the wake stocks, um, and some of the PWTs, like the one in Kelowna, where you'd have a three-day music festival and you'd have the tournament going on as well. Like those events were so much fun, um, fun to be a part of, fun for the spectators. Um, they weren't always in the best riding conditions, uh, but fun for the riders too, because it's always fun to have a big crowd. Yeah, I think I've I've talked to quite a, enough riders to to say. You know, I, I'm not going to speak for every rider, but I think that most of them would prefer the big crowd and they'd say, you know, screw the water conditions. I, you know, I don't care as much about the water conditions as having people getting eyes on this. Yeah, I think that it's like a twofold thing because we talked about that a little bit this off season. Like there was a couple different sites that were up for debate and, you know, some of them, it, it's hard to find a site that caters both, you know, that you can get a good crowd and that you can have water conditions. And there's really only a couple that I can think of that, you know, I've been to a lot of them and uh, there, there's one on Toronto Island that we used to go to for wake stock that that's in my mind, the best site in the world. It's, it's deep water. You're close. It, the, it's, it's narrow and the waves, you know, don't really affect it and you're not likely to get wind. Um, that's probably one of the best sites in the whole world. Um, and we, we got kicked out of there. We won't, we won't ever be allowed back. I don't think. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't even the wakeboarders fault. It was the crowd's fault. I guess that they had, because at Toronto Island, there's a ferry that has to run the people back and forth from the mainland to the island. And I think that there was an issue where there was, you know, some drunk people jumping off the ferry and, you know, creating problems for the local government. Because at that point, it's not a, you know, it's it's government related. So as soon as they had that liability, they're like, nope. Yeah. That's done. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting. So. I guess interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. People jumping off the boat <laughs> drunk. But um, I've always thought that instead of trying to get, and this is just my you know dumb wakeboard brain, but I've always thought instead of trying to get music events to come to, or like all this other stuff to come to the PWT, take the PWT to these other events. So yeah. like the one that comes to my mind is Electric Forest. And I don't know if there's a water venue next to it that's big enough, but you've got hundreds of thousands of people going to this music venue they don't know what wakeboarding is. Yeah. And do they care? Probably not, but they're going to watch it and they're going to have their iPhones out and they're going to be, you know, posting it and it's going to be cool. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, live action in front of you as long as the water's close enough to where the people are watching it. Cause it can't be far away. But that was always my thought is like, instead of trying to bring all these things to the PWT, take the PWT to 
these events and obviously it's easier said than done right it's like, so much easier said so, than done because that kind of stuff is tried like or it has been tried in the past and it probably will be tried again but man it's just a logistical nightmare like even the even the people that wanted us there like you know i mentioned x games x games wanted wakeboarding involved and it's just such a logistical nightmare to have wakeboarding as part of the x games because of the water aspect and because of needing specific sites and it just becomes this huge headache that they're like, oh, it's so much easier just not to have it yeah. than it is. To it's a lot easier to build a skate ramp than it is to find a perfect venue for to- wakeboarding. Totally. It's so. very, very, very difficult. So speaking of PWT, I mean, what are the uh, what are the stops this year? And like a little preview, you know, what's Yeah, so I think year? that we're um, I, I remembering off the top of my head. I think we're going to Indianapolis. I think we're going to Salt Lake City. Um, I think we're going to Groveland again. And I can't remember if we're going to Ackworth. I think we're going to Ackworth also. Um, so it should be, is four stops. Um, should be a lot, or maybe it's Tennessee. I think it's Tennessee. I I'm guess. pretty sure it's Tennessee. Yeah, so it might be Tennessee. Um, so pretty excited about it. It'll be, it'll be great. The Pro Tour is so fun these days, man. Like the, the level of riding that's, that's going on with the boys is, uh, is incredible. Super fun to watch. Yeah. Speaking of boys, are we ever going to get girls back on the Pro Tour? I hope so. I hope so. Like they get to come to the team at challenge event and it's super nice to have the girls on the tour, um, you know, as a part of the event. And I would love to have them on the tour. Like, you know, if, if I have to put my vote in, it'll be definitely to have, I'd like to have everybody. Like I like, I like it when the junior men riders are there. I like it when the wake skaters are there. Um, it's fun. It's fun to have a bigger event, but you know, it just comes down to dollars and cents and we need somebody to, to support that deal. So if there is someone out there listening to the podcast that would like to throw some money in to have the females on the tour, please do so because it's not for lack of wanting them on there. So PWT preview, we got how many riders are in the PWT 16? Is that usually what it is? Or is that? Yeah, I believe, I believe so. Yeah. I think it's 16 now. So give us uh, your overall winner. Who you think is going to win at the end of the year? Oh man! Give me one, two, three. Actually, one, two, three. Yeah, you're not so, the judge. You're the you're the driver. Yeah, yeah. So you could. Can... Yeah, totally. I'm the silent judge. I just. Well, I, you can actually decide. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can. Um, so, what I would like to see, or what I th- believe will happen, believe will happen. Okay. No bias. Okay. Um, I think Nick's going to have a super strong year this year. Um, he seems pretty focused. Um, so I would say Nick wins the tour. Um. Tyler, second. Because Tyler won last year, right? Overall. Yeah. Okay. Tyler won last year. Um, Tyler will probably be up there for second. And then, um, man, I'm hoping I'm hoping that Sam, like I'm, I'm always rooting for Sam. I love watching Sam do good, so I'd love to see Sam round out the podium. Okay. Be awesome. I like that. Maybe we'll do a little wager off camera here and we'll see. Because I think I got Ty High taking it again. But yeah. We'll see. Um, so kind of related to the Pro Wakeboard Tour the wake channel because you've worked a lot with like i guess actually just what is the wake channel for people who don't know what it is yeah so the wake channel is a youtube channel that we started um and the kind of the focus for wake channel is you know through through covid and through the last few years there's been obviously a tremendous boom in our industry you know there's a lot of newcomers into the sport um and a lot of people that have no idea what they're doing and so we kind of created the wake channel as a avenue to try to deliver information that would be necessary for newcomers. Um, so we're trying to do, you know, boat setup tips, um, not just like pro level setup tips, but like, how do you, you know, what's the equipment that you even need to have on the boat for a first time boat buyer? What's, um, how do you, you know, dock a boat? How do you drive a boat for a beginner? How do you get somebody up for the first time? Um, how do you turn around without getting rollers in the bow of the boat? Like that kind of stuff. Um, so we're trying to just, you know, create all kinds of content that would be helpful for not it mostly geared towards newcomers, but I think that even people that have been in the sport for a long time that might do things, uh, they were taught incorrectly or, you know, just never knew what they were supposed to be doing. Everyone can benefit from it. A lot of education. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. We, we did, we, we've dabbled with like a couple other little things. Like we would like to do different things on there also, but, um, most of our, most of our popular stuff has been all the educational stuff. So I think we'll stick to that for now. Definitely. There's obviously a need for that. If there's a, if it's popular, then there's a, there's a need for it. Well, there's just so many people too. Like, you know, you can go down a huge rabbit hole of, of wakeboarding being its own, you know, worst enemy of, 
you know, we sell people boats and they're big, loud, obnoxious, expensive boats and they draw a lot of attention. You know, like you can sell someone a pontoon boat for the first time, give them no instruction and they're not going to bother too many people out there. Like they're going to go cruise around and like the worst thing they'll do is drive too close to you. But you can sell someone a wakeboard boat and they've got a loud stereo. They've got uh, the capability of, you know, creating a monster surf wave. They don't know where to go. They don't know how far away from people or the shore or what line to run. They can make the lake seem very small, very quick. Um, and we're running into all kinds of lake issues because of that. Like the WSIA is, you know, running around with their hair on fire, constantly trying to um, put out all these flames of, of issues of people not knowing what to do. And it's not that they are doing it wrong on purpose, but that's what it seems like to the people that are, you know, if you've got a family that just bought, you know, an expensive lake house and they're bought it for the tranquility and they're sitting out on their dock and some Yahoo's driving by, you know, 10 foot off their dock, throwing a surf wave with, you know, the volume at a hundred, it seems very obnoxious. Yeah. And it seems intentional, even if it's not intentional. It doesn't matter if it's intentional or not because the, the effect is the exact same. Exactly. And my, my take on that is I, and maybe not, people might not love to hear it, but I think that starts at dealer at the dealer level. I think that every time someone buys a boat like this, a pamphlet is not even, no one's going to care yeah. that it's going to be thrown in the trash. Sure. YouTube video, they might pull it up on YouTube, but a lot of people think that they can just buy something and then they'll know exactly what, how to do it perfectly. Yeah. No, then I think it needs to be like an hour lesson. That's mandatory yeah. from the dealers to be like, no, sure. we're going out with you. The biggest problem is that a lot of the dealers don't know either. Like, you know, the, the you know, there are a lot of really good dealers out there. Like there's a, there's tons of them actually. Like there's some really good core dealers that you would for sure know the name of, and they are super involved in the industry. Their sales team are experienced wakeboarders. They're experienced surfers. They know what to do. They know what not to do. Then there's a whole nother segment of dealers that they have no idea what they, none of there's might not be anyone in the shop that has any idea even how to get up on a wakeboard. They're just selling. And they don't boats. really care. Either. No, they don't care yeah. at all. They're just selling boats. And that section is probably larger than the super experienced guys. Um, you know, the wakeboard boats are expensive. Like you've talked to them a lot uh, on the podcast. Like they're wakeboard boats are expensive. It's a corporate business and there's a lot of people that can profit from selling wakeboard boats. And so they do. And you know, the, they don't care what happens afterwards and that's unfortunate, but that's just kind of the way that it goes. Sometimes yeah. there are a lot of dealers that do care, but then there's a lot that, that don't, and they don't even know that they don't, they just, well, with anything like this, if there's money to be made, people are going to come in who don't really care about anything other than the money. Yeah. And so it's like, well, that sucks because now you're going to kind of ruin it for everybody else. Sure. So hopefully, you know, with the WSA, maybe there's a path forward in terms of, I don't know, I, I'd like to see it all squared away because I I definitely believe that the path forward is there's a lot of good we can do outside of all that stuff. But, but besides a one on one with the person who bought the boat that doesn't know what they're doing it's not going to be nearly as effective. That is going to be the most effective way. I think Yeah, to really for sure. sort this all out for sure. It, it, it's, it did. It's so funny. Like I, I talked to a guy at a boat show here recently that was telling me that he wanted to sell his boat because he hates his bimini top. He's like, dude, this is the hardest bimini top in the world to, to put up. And, uh, I said, dude, what are you talking about? Like this thing's so easy. Like it couldn't get any easier. And I showed him what to do. And he goes, that's not what I was taught. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no. I was like, what do you mean? And we, did, we went through, like, I showed him, he goes, this is going to save my marriage. He's like, I, he's like, I'm yelling at my wife. Like she hates going on the boat all because of this Bimini top. And it's just like a short little five minute thing that I'd had to explain to him how to do it right. And he was never taught how to do it. Yeah. And that happens with all aspects of setting up the surf wave of the boat buying process. And even like, like, that's all that people want to know. Like the setup question is one that that's like the number one question. Like, how do I set this up? And it's like, okay, cool. But once you get it set up, where are you going to drive this boat? Like, where are you going to go on the lake? Like, are you going to run right next to all the docks or are you going to try to find a shoreline where there are no docks? Or are you going to pick this hundred yard stretch? So that's the only place you're ever going to ride. And you're, you're just going to annoy everybody. Um, what happens if another boat's trying to ride that line? Like, what do I do there? Like, there's just so many scenarios that people don't even think of. They just want to know, how do I set this thing up? And then how do I do it? And then the rest of it, they just kind of figure it out. Yeah. When, and imagine if we taught people how to drive cars that way. Like, if we just said, 
Here's how to turn how it you, on. How do you start the car? Okay, perfect. See ya. <laughs> and that's all that you know. It, it did. Like, Left side of the road, right side of the road. Know, screw like, it. No. We, we've, we've got folders of rules and signs and all this stuff, and still everyone's mad on the road. Yeah. So, you know, it's nice that there are no rules out there on the lake and that you can kind of, you know, it's your own personal freedom, playground. Yeah. yeah, it's nice. But it also comes with its own set of consequences. Yeah, to preserve that freedom, you definitely need to, you know, follow the rules in a sense. And it's not even a big deal, dude. Like, none of it even really... None of it's a big deal. You just got to know it. Totally. If you don't. Well, and I would encourage people too. like a lot of people don't know that they don't know it. So like if you're somebody that's like even remotely new to the sport or you don't have a background or you weren't taught, like don't just assume that you're doing it correctly because yeah. you're probably not doing it right. And watch some of these YouTube videos. Watch, you know, there's a ton of stuff out there that you can find, like not just our channel, but like, you know, YouTube's a great source for pretty much anything. There's a lot of pro riders that have got channels. They all give good information. And uh, I would do some research, figure some stuff out. Yeah, definitely, definitely would. Um, yeah, good little, uh, good little segment there on, on some education. I think it's very important. Um, so I got some random questions. We can kind of sure go as fast or as slow as you want. And we'll start it off with a Patreon question from Rob Corum. And he's wondering, what's the best way to lift a rock sphere up a retaining wall? So the, uh, the root of this question is a very funny story. Um, so we were we were down in Mexico uh, doing a wakeboard event, and I, I think it was a WWA World Series event. And we went to the owner; the dealership was putting it on. We went to the owner's house, and it was a super nice house, uh, beautiful backyard. And we were sitting; we had all the riders there, and we're sitting at this table. And there was a lazy Susan built into the table, and so you know naturally we're there having dinner having a good time we figure out this lazy susan thing what do we do we start setting up shots of tequila on the lazy susan and then just spinning them around and seeing who's it lands on and you know then whoever it lands on has got to drink it right but me and andrew figured out that we could control the lazy susan with our foot and so we, from under the table from under the table <laughs> so there was like a little deal like you had to reach in pretty far but you could control it with your foot and so dude we were just like like Harley was getting landed on constantly. Like it was back when Harley was just destroying everybody. And so Harley and Phil, um, they were getting a lot of shots. Um, but it's a long story. But uh, after that, you know, now everyone's, you know, got too much tequila in them. We start playing around this guy's backyard and he has these concrete decorative spheres that probably, I mean, like a big, like strongman Atlas, like those big spheres somebody knocked it off its thing and it rolled dude like it rolled and rolled and rolled and this thing's like going down the hill and his house was kind of built up on a mountain it rolls off of the backyard and there's a retention wall that's like maybe five or six feet tall it rolls down this thing and it starts rolling and we're just like crap dude we got to go get that thing so we all jump down run try to go get it and uh get it and then an argument ensues over how to get this thing back over the wall because it's heavy and all of us are a little bit loose we're now we've got safety issues we're trying to pick up this big thing and it's getting dropped on people and we're almost crushing people with this giant couple hundred pound stone and uh it almost went to fisticuffs with with, <laughs> with a couple people and uh it, it was a, it was a pretty long story but good times how'd you get it up um i honestly think we left it <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we got to the point where we just couldn't do it anymore. The argument was uh, was too strong, and I think we left it. Yeah, we left it down there. <laughs> it needed Rusty. It was Rusty not there. He would have just tossed. Rusty it. was not there, unfortunately. Yeah, Rusty, that thing right yeah Rusty would have picked it up. <laughs> um, what is the favorite place that wakeboarding has taken you? Your favorite place? So, uh, get this question a lot. Um, it's hard to come up with a favorite place because there's so many. Like I always say, like. I appreciate every place that I've been because of wakeboarding. Like we had some awesome trips to Japan, um, awesome trips, to Australia, New Zealand, every trip that I've ever done to South America was awesome. And so it's hard to narrow down like one or two, you know, favorite trips. Cause there's just so many, but I do have a least favorite and that one's much easier to explain. And it's a pretty funny story. So if you're into it, I'll, I'll I'm, do, this might be my next question, but you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm very into it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so least favorite is Egypt. Yep. This is where I was going. Okay. So perfect. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, and uh, so 
me and uh Egypt is always a place I always wanted to go like I grew up like I, I'm a Christian and so Egypt to me like holds like a special place in my heart just from a biblical standpoint and then also it's just a cool place and so I was always excited to go look at the pyramids and like so when I got the opportunity to go to Egypt I was like dude this is gonna be epic it's so much fun no when you when we landed in Egypt we got picked up um, by a tour bus. So we've got IWWF used to do these events where they would bring, uh, I think it was like 24 guys. Um, you would get invited and they'd have a couple guys from each nation um, and do these big events. And so they would pick us all up and we would take a bus or it was very like, you know, it felt like you were like on a tour because it's like everyone's together. And so they pick us up from the airport in this bus we, the first stop is the pyramids. So they're like, we're going to go to the pyramids. You guys can all see them. And then we're going to go a couple hours to the event venue. And so I'm just fired up, like just got off the plane. We're going to go see these pyramids. I've got back then with no cell phones. So I've got my point and shoot camera out. Like I'm ready to roll full tourist mode. So get off the bus, camera in hand, like smiling, taking pictures. This is awesome this little Egyptian dude comes up to me and grabs my camera out of my hand and like snatches it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And he goes, oh, we'll take a picture, take a picture. I'm like, oh, okay, take a picture. And they start putting stuff on you. They're putting like the little headdresses on you and they're giving you headbands and, and all that stuff. And so at first I'm not that worried about it. I'm like, all right, we're just going to take a picture. But then everybody on the whole tour is going to the right and I'm going left with this dude. And I'm like, okay, I don't like this at all. Why am I being separated? He's got my camera, so I'm following him. And I'm trying to get my camera back the whole time. I'm like, just give me the camera. And he's like, no, we're going to take a picture. I'm like, okay, following him. And finally, I think I got to the point where I'm like, dude, just give me my camera. Like, I'm not coming any further. And he goes, there's a camel. And I said, oh, a camel? Sick. That's even better. So now I'm like full in. I'm ready you to bought go. It I'm now. ready to go with this guy. I'm like, he's got my camera. I'm going to see a camel. This is about to be epic. And it was epic all the way up until I got on the camel. And now we're like riding out into the desert and I'm riding with this dude. We're just like going and we're headed out into the desert. And I'm like, everybody is half a mile that way. And I'm way out in the desert with this dude sitting on this camel. So he, I don't know if you've ever seen a camel in person. They're huge. And, and they can move too. Cause oh, I've watched can, camel racing before. Yeah, they can move. Yeah, they can move. So like, we're like galloping out into the desert on this thing. And then, we get out there. He has the camel kneel down so that he can get off. He gets off the camel and then the camel stands back up. And then I'm stuck on the back of this camel. Like it's 12 feet in the air and I'm just sitting on the back of this camel. And he's like, give me all your money. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course, this is exactly where I thought this was going. And uh, so I'm like, dude, I, I don't want to be robbed, but I also don't want to die in the desert. So I'm like, whatever, give them whatever money I had on me. Like I'd like had just gotten in the country. I don't even know what this money's worth. Like I literally just got it. Like I had it for 10 minutes. So give him a bunch of money. Um, he ends up taking my picture. Then he gets back. Now my captor is back on the camel with me and we're riding back. And I'm like, bum dude. I'm like, dude, how embarrassing. Like I'm the only guy out of, 30 dudes like I'm gonna have to go explain that I just got robbed to everybody like this is so stupid and then I'm riding back on this camel and I look up and I see Rusty Andrew Philip everyone's on camels everyone's headed out into the desert and I'm just waving at them I'm like so you're coming back and I'm they're, coming back and they're headed they're out. going to get robbed they're, they're going you just yeah it's all it's all just a giant sham like it's <laughs> all like everyone's in on it like we get we get back to the tour bus and we're talking to the tour guide. Like we had a tour guide on our bus and he goes, we're, we're talking about how much money we got taken for. And he goes, Oh yeah, it happens all the time. And I go, why didn't you say something first? Like, why didn't you warn us? Why didn't you say, don't get on the camel? It's like, super simple not to get on the camel. Everyone's in on that deal. Like everyone's getting paid. This is this giant sham. Yeah. And uh, they got us, man. They got us for like a couple thousand bucks probably when you added up all the, all the money. Yeah. But so the story continues because I get on the bus and he did take my picture. And so, I'm going through the pictures and I go, you know what? It's actually a very sick picture. Like I'm sitting in the desert with my little headdress deal on, on the camel. There's like four pyramids in the back. Like this is an epic picture, even though I had to pay a bunch of money for it. Yeah. At least I got this picture. 
But then uh, two days later, my hotel room got broken into and my camera got stolen. And so I don't have those pictures anymore. So yeah, Egypt. Egypt. No. We were only there for four days. Robbed and you got robbed twice. Robbed twice. Okay. Robbed twice. And we didn't have the event. Like the event, I think, I don't remember who talked about this in their podcast, but one of the other riders talked about this. Like we, we went there. I think Rusty might have. Yeah. So we went there to do the event and it was in the ocean, man. Like they literally just had, their plan was just to run it down the beach. And this, it was like three or four foot swells coming in. Like they put the boat in and the boat got picked up off the trailer and slammed back down so hard that it broke the boat (laughs) and they, they couldn't run the event. So they had a little lagoon inside the resort. It was like a grand opening for some resort. They had a little lagoon that they gave us a jet ski and they said, just figure something out, like do whatever you can do. And so we were taking like all the plastic docks. We built like a little jump over a walkway um, out of the plastic docks. They had all these little handrails, like most of them, not, not as long as this table. And we would just like set up two or three of them in a row. And we made like this little course and we ran a full contest. Like everyone got paid like, you know, I think it was like 3,500 bucks or something like that, that everyone, we ended up splitting all the prize money and uh, everyone got paid. And we did this little demo, hit double ups behind a jet ski in this little canal. So besides the getting robbed, that part actually sounds kind of fun. Split the prize money, mess around in the lake. It was pretty fun. Everyone got food poisoning also. And so everyone was super sick. And so like me and Rusty were sharing a room and like, I'm not kidding you. Like we're like waking up in the middle of the night and like wrestling each other to get to the bathroom. Like it was like bad. And uh, I think one of the dudes actually had to have surgery when he came back on his intestines because he like got so like some kind of crazy bug. Uh, It was brutal. It was, it was, it was a brutal trip. So I have heard on about Egypt when you go visit the pyramids, that's like the number one still nowadays, like you get scammed. Yeah. Like people just, they'll pester you to no end. So we, we didn't enjoy ourselves so much that like the last day was like a free day that we could go like walk around and do whatever we wanted to do before we got on our plane. I didn't leave the hotel room. Like we just sat in the hotel room. I was like, dude, I'm not leaving. I don't care how long we have to sit here. I think we sat in the hotel room, not watching. They didn't have any English TV. So it was like, 10 hours that we just sat in a hotel room. I think we left once to go get a sandwich from the lobby and that was it. We just sat in the room doing nothing. I was like, get me out of this place. I didn't like it at all. And I was so amped up to go there. Like I tell people all the time, I'm like, I don't know what it would take to get me to go back to Egypt, but I would like, I would like a host to take me next time because, you know, maybe I'd see a different side, but the side I saw, I don't ever want to see it again. (laughs) That story was a lot better than I thought and I knew it was going to be good. Yeah. Um, speaking of travel, uh, Zane Schwenk, talked to him a little bit, and he was wondering if you've ever had your backpack puked in by your brother. So I haven't, but uh, but Andrew has. Oh, it was Andrew. Andrew's backpack. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, we used to do these road trips. That was me and Reed were only on CWB for a short time together. Like he he was on it for I think maybe two years, um, and then he left and and started doing the Wakeskate deal. Um, but there was a brief time where, where we were together. And so we would do a road trip every year because we would fly up to, there was always a tournament somewhere around Van, Vancouver area. Um, and so we would fly to Washington, kind of do a CWB factory deal, probably our product shoot um, somewhere in Washington. And then we would all drive to the Pro Tour together. And Reed was sitting in the back, Zane rented a, a van and Reed gets car sick and he didn't even know at the time that he gets car sick, um, but he's sitting in the back and we're going up the, you know, the the pass in the mountains, and he starts getting car sick and he's only like, I think he's probably only thirteen years old. He didn't say anything, like he never spoke up, never said a word. Next thing we know, we just hear him puking, we turn around and he's got Andrew's backpack open. <laughs> he's just puking in Andrew's backpack, and like this is pre. Pre cell phones, pre like, uh, pre all the like people had cell phones, but it's like not what it was. Like everyone had their their cell phones, but you weren't using it for like your calendars and stuff. And so like Andrew's got like all of his dates written down like in his planner that like is his summer schedule, and Reed's puking all over all of it. Dude, it it got heated. Andrew was so mad. Like I don't know if you've ever spent any time around Andrew, but that dude used to snap like. 
He That's would, what Zane did say. Zane said he got in some. He some would toughness. have some fits. He may or may not have been the fisticuffs person <laughs> in, in, in the Atlas. Me and Andrew used to have some serious run-ins with each other. We were on CWB for a long time together, and so we had some serious run-ins. Um, but dude had a, dude had a short fuse, very short. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, he got his backpack puked, and I can yeah. only imagine what his reaction. Yeah, Reed Reed wasn't too excited about it either. <laughs> um, so you drive on the PWT. I'm, I'm wondering who you think the best towboat driver in the world is. Well, I listened to Travis' podcast, and Travis claimed it pretty hard. So he did. He did. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I you know, I'd put my name in the hat. Um, you know, there's some good drivers out there. I think that for for a wakeboard driver, you just have to care. Like Travis was saying, you got to pay attention and uh, know what the rider wants. And I think there's probably a, a lot of guys out there that, that fit that mold. Yeah. Looking for a definitive, the best. I mean, I'll, I'll be the best if you want me to do it. <laughs> That's fine. All right, Travis Moy, you heard it here first, yeah. buddy. I don't know how you, I don't know how you set up a drive off, but like we could do. I, it. I was just I was yeah. thinking in my head. I was like, can you? Even, I don't yeah, know, I don't think you can set it up. I will say this that like Travis, Travis did an awesome job on the tour for a long time. Like yeah. I, I had a lot of complaints with the tour back in the day, and almost none of them were ever with Travis. You know, Travis did a, an amazing job, and he's one of the best boat drivers in the world. Yeah, for that's sure. what I've heard for sure. So, yeah. um, what are some of the most underrated tricks in wakeboarding, or maybe just the most underrated trick? Oh man, um, what do you mean by underrated? Like something that doesn't get the love that it deserves, or it's yeah, it, or it's it's harder than you think that it is. I, yeah, either of those, either of those. I think that it depends on the rider because I think that like a, you know, like a back mob five is so hard, and it gets a lot of love, but it kind of got like, there's a couple people that can do it really well. And so it kind of like doesn't hold the same. Like Tyler Hyam has an amazing back mode five. Yeah. Crazy good. Yeah. And like, there's some guys that do it really well. And it's so, like, that trick is so hard. Like it, it, it is so difficult. And you know, that it's, it's one that I think that it gets cracked off a lot at the pro tour these days. And it's, it's easy to just say, Oh, I did a back mode five, but it's like, man, that is a hard, yeah. hard trick. And, um, I mean, people already know that a blind Pete's hard, but like, it, you know, that, that trick is very, very difficult also. But like at the same time, Harley and Phil used to crank that thing out. Like it was nothing. Like they would just do them and they would never fall on them. And it's like, yeah, a couple guys figured it out, but man, that's a hard trick. Yeah. It doesn't make it not hard because yeah. a couple guys got yeah. it locked in. Yeah, that's so. a hard trick, but they, there's, there's a lot of them like, you know, everyone always throws the big method out into the flats. Like that's, that's as difficult as to do well. That's as difficult as anything that you could really do. Cause it's very difficult to get the grab, hold on to it. And, and then right away and clean. Then, yeah. yeah. And take it all the way out there. Um, who do you make the best wakeboard memes? Man, I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a the meme game has been kind of popping off lately. I don't know if you've noticed. I, I love it. I'm a huge fan. I love it. I think it's great. There's nothing better than scrolling through and uh, and seeing a good wakeboard meme. Because even if you totally disagree with it, it's still great. I don't. I've yet to see one that I totally disagree <laughs> with. You know. It's, yeah, that's true. I guess. You know, like they're all. That's that's the fun part about memes. Is like, you know, there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of truth, even though it even though it hurts a little bit. Yeah, it can sting, but it's still yeah. Because because yeah. you're you're big on the meme game, and you're on the video meme game now too. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's, I guess you have it, Yeah, it's fun to. Uh, it's fun to come up with those things, you know. Like, there's a lot of things in wakeboarding that you can poke fun at, and uh, it's fun to fun to poke fun at those things when you get the opportunity. You know, it sure is in fun a, to poke fun at yeah, some stuff in a, in a lighthearted way. You know, it's fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's talk kind of the present and the future. So, you mentioned you still do ride. I'm wondering how often you ride. Not not as much as I should. Um, I still really enjoy getting out there, but I literally just don't get out there much. Like I'm, you know. Usually when I'm on the boat, I'm doing stuff for the tour. I'm doing stuff for coaching and not a lot of times is there a driver. Uh, you know, I'm, when I coach at my place, I'm doing it by myself. I drive in, I coach at the same time. So I don't have, you know, someone else with me. Um, so I'm usually me and seven beginners that are out there, um, cruising around. So it's hard to find a driver. Um, and then just throughout time have fallen out of, you know, constant contact with a lot of the guys that I used to ride with and all that stuff. So I don't like 
call them up and say, hey, let's go for a shred. It just doesn't happen. But um, I probably get out there, you know, once a month, maybe, or, or less than that. Like once a month, probably be pretty generous. Pretty generous. So 12 times a year would be generous. Yeah. Be generous. We need to pump those numbers up. I know. Cause I do mean, like I just rode for the first time this year, uh, the other day and, uh, had a blast. Super fun to, to be out there riding. But I, these days I spend way more time sitting in the driver's seat than I do actually back there. Yeah. All right. I think I'll talk to Cody Honeycutt and I'll see what I can do about pumping those numbers up a little yeah. bit. Yep. So, uh, what, what gets you stoked on wakeboarding right now though? Um, I mean, the whole, the whole sport is, is in an awesome spot right now. Like it, it's crazy because the, uh, the technology that we have with the boats nowadays and how big the wakes are and the riders capabilities and what they're able to do on the boat is so fun to watch. And then I think that we're in like a really unique spot too. You know, I know you've talked a lot about wake surfing and, and that being, you know, what most people are doing nowadays, but I think that it's switching a little bit because like I run these beginner camps all summer long and I couldn't force these kids to wake surf last summer. Like a lot of times I want them to wake surf because it's just like at a certain point, it's so much easier just to not be screaming at them from behind the boat and they can just be right there and it's easier to teach them. And, um, I would have loved to have like one day of just full wake surfing, but everyone was like, no, I don't want to do that at all. Like they'd try it one time and be like, nope, don't like it back to wakeboarding. And a lot of these younger kids, I think that because they see like their parents wake surfing and they just don't want to do what their parents are doing or whatever it is. But, uh, there's definitely like a little bit of a resurgence. So I think that that's super sick. And I'd like, you know, I'm excited to see what happens with that. Yeah. I'm excited to see the kind of the future of it too, because I think, I think wake surfing as a whole, you know, it's been good to get people on the water. And I think you're hitting it spot on, at least I'm hoping. And I've been hearing from other people as well. It's not just you that are saying that. So yeah, maybe a little, a little resurgence in the, the long line. It's just exciting to see people like falling in love with it again. Yeah. You know? Cause like, uh, you know, there was a long time where it seemed, it seemed kind of stale. There wasn't like a lot going on. There didn't seem like there was a lot of new blood coming in, but now there's some young kids. There's you know, some really good riding. Like I said, like the talent pool in the, in the pro division right now is crazy. And then there's, there's some good young riders too. Yeah. So, there's a ton, yep. a ton out there. Uh, so before we jump into the Patreon questions, which will air um, on Patreon the day after this episode comes out and then they'll, you know, air publicly this Sunday after this episode comes out. So before we jump into those, which will be a separate video on YouTube, um, anyone you want to thank or anything else you want to talk about? Man, I mean, we could talk all day about all different kinds of stuff in, sure the, in, in the sport, but um, yeah, the list of the list of thank yous would be super long. Um, you know, I got to thank you know my my wife. Obviously, like me and her uh, have been together throughout my entire career. Like we we started dating in in tenth grade, and so that was like right as I was becoming a pro rider, and and so she's been with me the whole time. So super grateful for all her support throughout time and. Um, obviously my parents for, for helping to provide an avenue for us to get into the sport. Like if it wasn't for them, you know, purchasing the camp and kind of helping us dive head first into it, we never would have had the opportunity to pursue it. Um, so definitely got to thank them. And, and then, you know, my brother and, and, you know, everyone that has been involved in the sport, my sponsors like Supra Conley, you know, they were kind of the core Roswell was like a huge part of my career for a long time. Um, and then all the riders like there, I could sit here and thank riders for 15 minutes, I bet. So the, super grateful for all the different crews that we got to hang out with and, and all the people that we spent time with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you a ton for coming on. This has been a great chat. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, rate that five stars. If you haven't already, I really appreciate that. Um, and if you're interested in joining the Patreon, it really helps support the podcast. So Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing this. Super important for wakeboarding. So I'm grateful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. See you guys next time.